every, every time uh, every time I watch that, I just I just cry. <laughs> it's uh, it's it's kind of like the story of my life. <laughs> you know, have you ever just listened to something you said that sounds like my life? My grandmother was the, was the greatest influence on my Christian life than any, any, anyone. Uh, you know, when he, he starts out with his grandmother, and then he starts out with his mom making him go to church, that's, that's me. You know, my mama used to tell us, uh, tell me and my brother that uh, they said two things is going to happen on Sunday morning. You go into church and said there's two things. You can either go to church with a whoop butt or without one. But you go. I mean, I like I mean I I'm kinda of, I'm standing here I'm, I can almost see her that telling me that. She was one of those no nonsense people. She was a she was hardcore. She was a She was a supervisor, <clears throat> nursing supervisor at DCH for years. Over being and shift. And, and when I was in the hospital with a COVID pneumonia, I had a had a lady, a black lady that was my nurse when, when I when they gave me the antibody transfusion. And um, and she had to be with me for about uh, the first 30 minutes of when they started it because they had to monitor your vital signs to make sure you're not rejecting it or make sure you don't die there while they're doing it. And you, so, of course, you sign a paper saying, you know, basically if, if once we start this and it kills you, you won't sue us. <clears throat> but, you know, when you're running 104 temperature and you think you're about to die, you'll take whatever they give you. You know, just, you know, so give me a, we're going to give you a dose of iced tea, IV. I'll go ahead. <laughs> Bud Light, you know, go ahead. But, uh, but so, so she was there with me for about 30 minutes. And uh, so, you know, if somebody's there 30 minutes, you're going to strike up a conversation. And I began to tell her about my mom being a nurse and su nursing supervisor out here and uh, at DCH. And she said, yes, Miss Kelly. She said, she was my nursing supervisor. <laughs> and she said, I loved her. She said, but she was a no-nonsense woman. <laughs> I said, you got that right. <laughs> but that, that's how it was. You went to church. You know, there ain't no, no question. It's kind of like, you know, John Hagee told, said his his dad said they were going to church, and if he said, if we said, well, I'm sick, and he said, well, we'll just lay hands on you and heal you. <laughs> but it it talks about talking to Jesus. The song talks about talking to Jesus, and. The second chapter of James is what I'm going to be teaching on, but I'm, I'm not starting on it yet till I get through what I got on my heart. I'm just, you know, we're not in no, y'all in any hurry? We're not in no hurry. I, at 7.30, I'll quit. I mean, I'm not, I'm kind of like what Dave Turner said. I'm, I'm kind of like baloney. You can cut it off. I can cut it off. But, I feel. I, I mean, when I was sitting there, and, I, and when I first uh, heard this song, you know, I cry. I, I cried so much, and and then we, uh, when we had the uh, uh, band of brothers thing with Chad Wright at uh, Camp Tuscoba, it, it, it made me think about this because after after he got through, he had a little question and answer, and somebody asked him asked the question uh, because he got saved. Uh, and if you want to, you can turn this thing down, Bill. It's, it's, 
because I'm talking real soft right now, but I'm going to really start talking loud after a while. Oh, uh, but they asked him a question. He got, he got saved on a, on a deployment. Can, can you imagine if, if you're married and, uh, and you who you are, and then when you come home from deployment, you have been saved and born again? Well, somebody asked him the question, said, what did your wife think about you getting saved when you went back home? And, uh, and he said, you know, I really didn't want to talk about this, but he said, I will. He said, uh, my wife was a drug addict. He said, matter of fact, she was, such a bad, she was such a bad drug addict that she was at the point of almost dying. So she would she would take drugs and, not, and like she would sleep for three days, and um, and he said I did the only thing that I knew how to do. He said I started praying. <laughs> oh, I mean I want y'all I want I want you to think about that. He said I did the only thing I knew to do. I started praying. Do you know that's the most important thing that you can do? <laughs> if, if something's going on in your life, if something's going on, going on with a family member of your life, you need to be praying. You need to be talking to Jesus. And he said, that's what I started doing. He said, I started praying. He said, I started walking around my house praying. And he said, one day, in one of her better days, we was at, on Virginia Beach. And uh, he said, she just came to me and she said, I want to be clean. And he said, that started a process where she was changed. But it started from prayer. It started from talking to Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. Oh. oh. So powerful. <laughs> so powerful. has nothing to do with what I'm going to teach on. <clears throat> but, but I want you I don't know. I don't know each and every one of you's life, your life. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know about all your family members. But I can just almost bet there's problems in your family that you need to be talking to Jesus. I need to be talking to you. Because that's the only thing that's going to change. And guess what? It's powerful. It's powerful. That's the only thing that will change whatever's going on. Now what we what we've been we've been teaching the book of John. I'm gonna pray, and then we'll start in this. Father, I love you. I thank you, God, for another opportunity to teach your word, to preach, to speak. God, I pray that you would anoint the ears to hear what that I would say. Let the word touch their heart. Let the spirit that's within them move. God, not only to hear the word, God, but take the word and God do what it says. God, some of the things that I'm going to say, God, are, will not be easy. But help them to take the word because it is your word. And if they need to change, let them change. God, You sure have worked on me 
with this. So if I say something that hits somebody between the eyes, God, I hope they understand that, God, you've hit me between the eyes a lot with it. But the thing is, when when your word says do something, we need to do it. And God, I pray tonight that whatever I say that your word says, if it convicts, God, let it be a conviction that changes, not a conviction that condemns. God, you never condemn us. You don't condemn us, God. You convict us. You convict us to change. Help us to change. Help us to uh, do what your word says. Bless all that's here. Thank you for the opportunity again. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. If you will, just turn your Bibles to James, the second chapter. And I and forgive me for running my mouth, but I'm a preacher. That's what we do. You know, somebody said, uh, what about that preacher? He talks too much. Well, that's what preachers do. They talk. And, but uh, y'all like my handkerchief. I couldn't find one of my white handkerchiefs. And I did a wedding I don't forgot what wedding it was, and they gave me one of these things to put in my coat, and I was looking through my coat, and I found this. So. But but we started in the book of James, and um, and James, you know, we said was the half brother of Jesus. Also, James was the uh, he was head over the church in Jerusalem. He was a head guy. You know, he was a head knocker. He was the head uh, CEO or whatever. You know, he was the man in charge. And uh, have, have you ever... Uh, so when James says things, it comes from a perspective of somebody who's in charge of something. Now, God gives, gifts different people with different gifts. Now, if you're in charge of something and you're successful at being in charge of that, you have a certain personality and a gifting that God is giving you. And sometimes it's what you call a no-nonsense type person. You know, that uh, the person is in charge. See, let's just take, for instance, me and Pastor Randy here. Now, Pastor Randy's in, he's the head, head of this place. You know, he he's the head guy. I'm the assistant. Now, Pastor Randy sometimes can be hard. <clears throat> he, but he needs to be. He needs to be because... See, if everything goes to... heck in a handbasket... They're going to look at him. They ain't going to come look at me. I'm the sister. You know, they're going to come look at him. So he, God has gifted him with a type of personality to be, to be that leader. And he's gifted me with the personality of being the assistant, and so I'm different. Some of the things that he would be hard on, I'd probably be light on. And James is the guy that's in charge. So some of the things that James says in, in his letter is going to be pretty hard and straightforward. But when you start reading letters from Paul, Paul is a, is assistant. Do y'all y'all get what I'm talking about? And it doesn't mean that that what James says is is not right, and it doesn't mean that what Paul says is not right, but it's two different personalities and it's two different giftings. So when you read James and you say, man, that, that's pretty hard right there. And you read Paul, I said, but Paul's a little softer over here. It's different types of people. And one of the things that we have to understand in life, God has gifted each one of us in different areas and when we, we need to learn what that gift is and we need to be in that. We need to work with that gift. 
I understand. I understand my gifting is not to be the senior pastor. And if I bet, and if I ever thought I ever wanted to be a senior pastor, when Pastor Randy had his wreck and he was in the hospital for 55 days and I got to be the acting senior pastor, I realized that was not my calling. Now, Pastor Randy, I, I love him and I was praying for him to get better, but I was so praying for him to get better where he can get back to be the senior pastor. <laughs> there wasn't no takeover. <laughs> there wasn't no coup. That man's trying to tell him, oh God, please let Pastor Randy come back. You know, when, when something was going on, when they come in the front door there, it was going to filter back to my office, which used to be the end. And I always said, I'm glad it's toward this door because if it gets too loud, I'm going to go out that back door. See, but they always got Pastor Randy, he's the front there. You know, they could get to him. And the reason why I said this, because some people think that James is counteracting what Paul said. And some people even say that James wrote this book to counteract what Paul's writings was. Well, that's a bunch of hooey. Because James' book was written before Paul's letters. And if you'll read it and think about it and pray about it, he's just backing up what Paul is talking about. But the book starts off, and it's talking about a testing of our faith. And we started out in the first chapter where the testing of our faith, we get our faith tested in trials. Now, we don't want none of that, do we? Nobody wants a trial. But, the, but you're going to have them. You might as well get ready. They're coming. You've already had some, or if you hadn't had some, let me let this preacher help you. They're coming. Oh, God, I didn't come to hear that. And then, then it went on, and uh, Pastor Randy taught the, the, the first chapter there about the trials, testing of our faith. Then Sean came in and taught about the things that we do when we're in trials, you know, what we learn, you know. We, we're, we're, we'll, we're to be uh, swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to write. You know, I always tell them kids on my bus, you know why you got one mouth and two ears? And they say, why, Mr. Kelly? I said, because you need to listen twice as much as you talk. You need to think about that. I do. I was counseling a while ago. I, I got here... I was upstairs and I was counseling and, and some of my counseling to this couple was they was uh they was quick to speak. They were both quick to speak. And I and I said, You need to be slow to speak, quick to hear. I'm gonna help somebody here in a minute. So we're talking about a testing of our faith. Now, when the, uh, he starts the second chapter and he talks about something else that's a little bit different. He said, this is something that you can test your faith and, and see if your faith is real and see if your faith is based on love. See if your faith is based on the spiritual and not your flesh. Now, I'm going to tell you, I've, I've been teaching nearly 40 years and like I told Pastor Randy, when I first started teaching, I, I taught because nobody else would. Now, that may not be a reason to start teaching. You know, you might, you might want to pray to God and be sure, because we'll find out, you know, teachers have a, a greater responsibility. But that's how I started teaching. I was in the church and nobody wanted to teach. And, and I just loved God so much and He'd done so much for me. I said, bless God, I'm... I, I'm going to teach if nobody else will. And I told Pastor Randy, I, and I taught some of this book of James, of, of James, and I had no idea what I was teaching. I told Pastor Randy I had to read. I had to read the, uh, uh, the instructions. You know, before, <laughs> before I got up and taught the class, I was reading the instructions, you know. I was reading along with them. I was learning along with them. 
But some of the stuff now that since I've been teaching long enough, God showed me and, and I can answer a lot of those questions. But I can safely say I've never taught this. And the reason being is because we always go past it. And it's James, the second chapter. I'm going, I'm going to read... Uh, I'm going to read from the first verse to the 13th verse. And if I get through 13 verses before 730, I'll stop. No, I'm going to stop whether I get through or not. But this is, this is how far I plan to go. Now, this is something that we can find out if our faith is pure and what motives our faith is. It says, my brethren. Now, now, what we have to understand, when it says my brethren, we know who it's talking to. It's talking to believers. You know, and, and we'll find out later. The, but this letter was written to believers. You know, it said it was written to the 12 tribes. It was mostly Jewish believers, but it can be, it can be, it's a timely letter. We can set it down today and we can set this letter in New Beginning Family Worship Center in Northport, Alabama, April the 14th, 2021. 2021 what? Is it A.D.? Oh, you ever thought about that? 2021 A.D. We measure time after Christ. The one that people don't believe in. Thought I'd throw that out. It says, My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your, your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man with filthy clothes, and you, pay, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, You sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, You stand there. Or sat here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil faults? Listen, listen, my beloved brethren. Has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? He's asking questions. I'll go on. I was going to say something. Verse 6. But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the, ro the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Verse 10, it says, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. Like what I said, uh, James is kind of a no nonsense guy. <clears throat> He's kind of hard, but he's in charge. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak, and so do, as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Okay, we can go home now. <clears throat> Have you ever heard anybody teach on that? I haven't. I've never taught on it. You know why? Because I just skim over it.
because I'm guilty. Now, I don't want to be so bold as to say that you are too, but I will. You are too. We have, we have a tendency to have this in us. And let's look at it. It says, My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. So, is partiality is having personal favoritism. It's, it's showing favor to one person over another. And, and we'll go, go on and go... Well, well let, me, let me give the... The definition of partiality is to have respect of persons by the outward appearance and the economic status. We ever do that? Being partial to one person over the other because of maybe their appearance. They don't quite look like what we think they should. You know when... uh, now I used to, God's dealt with me. I mean, if you if you live for God forty years or fifty years, if, if God hadn't dealt with you on some of these things, you, you just you, you fooling yourself. God deals with us. And God's dealt with me on this subject, and I'm not near as judgmental and partial, show as much partiality as I I used to. When we uh. On well, Saturday at uh, Saturday, you know, South, you say Saturday, you know, Saturday at um, uh, Camp Tuscoba, when when Chad Wright uh, walked up there in them swimming trunks, you know, when he walked up there in them swimming trunks and that T-shirt and them and black, black socks and a uh, uh, tennis shoes, and it looked like he hadn't combed his hair, and looked like he's, he he ain't combed his beard either. You know, I just kind of looked, and I said, "Well, look at here. <laughs> it's gonna be good." <laughs> but but did, did we not? Did did we not look at people sometimes and 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 get an idea about them when we shouldn't? I was I was in a Church of God camp meeting several years ago, and I was up in the choir, and I'm up there, and and there's this guy just right down from me there. He he had really long stringy hair, and he and he didn't have any hair up here. He had less hair than I have. But his hair was really long and stringy, going down his back. He had on some blue jeans that kind of had holes in them. And, and he just looked weird. I'm, I'm talking about he looked weird because we're at a Church of God camp meeting. I don't know if you've ever been to Church of God camp meeting, but they dress to the nines, brother. I'm up there, and every now and then I kind of glance over at him. I said, what is that do? Well, it rocked on there, and they said, we got a, we got a special guest. He's going to come up here and play. And I look over, and he's got a trumpet. He said, his name is Phil Driscoll. Y'all ever heard Phil Driscoll? Well, old Phil, old Phil, he gets up there, you know, with his outfit. He pulls that thing out. I, I, I've never heard anybody play like that. I'm talking about, he, he played like he was talking. I thought I was going to have a heart attack. He was so good. 
God taught me a lesson. Years ago, God taught me a lesson right there. God said, now you had, done, you had, already, kept, you had already cut him off. You had already made a judgment of that man. And that was the most anointed, one of the most anointed musicians I've ever heard in my life. But I, 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 much, I pretty much cut him off. And God dealt with me. Does God deal with you, you guys like that? Verse 2 says, he, 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 he tells us, he gives us where this is taking place. He said we shouldn't have partiality and he's showing where this takes place. He said, for if there should come into your assembly, into your sanctuary, into your church, into your synagogue. Does, does that, as, as the comedian said, that ring a bell? He's talking about in the church. So this is happening in the church. He said if there's a man coming and he looks like he's got a lot of money, and then there's another man that comes who don't look like he's got a lot of money, and you pay more attention. Now, l l let me go back. Do you think God's partial? Do you, got, do you think God plays favors? Do you think God shows partiality? Acts 10, 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. You know, when, when, when God told Peter, you need to go to Cornelius' house, preach the gospel. You know, when he gives Peter the dream about the clean and the unclean animals and all that. Peter didn't, Peter didn't, Peter didn't want to go to Cornelius' house because Cornelius was a Gentile and he wasn't like his people. Peter didn't want to go. You know what Peter said? In Peter's mind, the reason why I know he did that because that's the reason why God gave him the dream. God says, I know what he's thinking about. I know how Peter is. Peter, if I tell Peter to go to Cornelius' house, he's not going to go there because he's not a Jew. He's not like the person. He's not like who he thinks he should be. I'm going to give him a dream. And Peter says, after these dreams and... You know, see, Peter says, I perceive God shows no partiality. So we know God's not partial. How do you think God looks at the rich man and how do you think God looks at the poor man? The absolute same. God don't play favorites. That's the way we should be. It says, if you, if you take... The man with, with the fine clothes. It looks like he's got a lot of money. But you take and you put him at a, a favored place in the, in the sanctuary. Well, if, if one come in here and, and we all rush to this man because he's got a lot of money and we say, hey, we've got a really good seat for you. Come up here. And then the poor man comes in and we don't pay him no attention we say, how about you sitting over there in the corner? Don't make a whole lot of noise. That's what he's saying. Let me ask you something. And I thought about this. If I was going to meet Donald Trump, How would I act? Or if I was going to meet a homeless man, how would I act? Do you think God would act any different toward Donald Trump than he would the homeless man? 
Ares davlatlar verirdi. It's a test. It's a test of our faith to see if our motives are from love or if it's from our flesh. Let me, let, me, let me read on down. It says, because when we do this, when the rich man comes in and we pay attention to him, and the poor man, we, 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 we put him off in the corner. Verse 4, have you not shown partiality? Ha, have, you, have you not shown favoritism among yourself and become judges with evil thoughts? See, when we do that, we, we judge. We make a judgment. And, and we can say whatever we want to. We make a judgment because we look at that man with money and said, we need that. We need him. We need He can help us. We're, 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 we're judging. And we look at the poor man and we say, you know, he can't. He, he, he can't help. Is that not what we do when we do things like that? Now, now wait a minute. See, when you read this and you think about it, you say, well, we just need to rush to the poor man and forget about the rich man. No! We should treat both the same. We should treat whether he's got money or no money, whether he's rich or poor. We can't pay attention to one and neglect the other one because we do. When we do, we're showing favoritism. It's wrong. As a matter of fact, when I get down through here, and I may not ever get there, it's sin. That's what he says. It's sin when we do that. Let me ask you a question. If it's a drug addict, if it's an alcoholic, if they come here, is this a place to come and find help? If they come and they sit back there on the back row, is this a place where somebody's going to come beside them, put their arm around them and say, I love you, and I'm so glad that you came to church? Because everything we do for God needs to be motivated from love. It needs to be motivated because God first loved us. Because what is, it, what is the two greatest commandments? It's to love God with all your heart. Why do you love God with all your heart? Because He first loved you. Because He saved you. And since He saved you, that you love Him first. And He says, and the second thing is likened to that, you love your neighbor as yourself. So everything that we do should be motivated from those two things. I, I, I'm on them. So when that person comes in here, now, now let me tell you something. On oh, Sunday morning they're coming. Sunday morning they're coming. They're everywhere. They're here. You talk about, I want to do some mission work for God. Oh my goodness, it's here. Oh, it's full. Just look. Sunday morning, when, when you come through that door... And we're bad about it. I'm bad about it. God's busted me between the eyes. I mean, my eyes should be black and swelled up. He, he's hit me. Well, what do we do when we come in the door? We got certain people that we like to talk to, don't we? I mean, and I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not jumping on you. I do the same thing. You know, there's certain people I like to talk to. I go to them, I talk to them. But what about that person that, that comes in and they don't say anything to anybody and they set off somewhere? Shouldn't that be the one 
We need to be looking. For. Shouldn't that be the one that we need to kind of get up beside them and put our arm around them and say, man, I'm glad you're here. I'm so glad you came. Is there something I could pray? Is something going on in your life I could pray about? You know what a friend we have in Jesus. You know, I know I, I know a friend named Jesus. I can pray. That's what this is all about. There's God opportunities every Sunday and Wednesday just sitting in the chair, pick one. There's a son, there's a daughter, there's a father, there's a mother. We need to love them. Can you imagine somebody that's been begging their family members for years and years about coming to church and, and they never come to church and then just one Sunday out of the blue they show up. And you know what, you, you know what that person that's been inviting them for is, is hoping, oh God, I hope somebody talks to. I hope somebody talks. You know, I have people come up to me sometimes and say, I got somebody, I got a family member here I really would like for you to talk to. You know what I really would like to talk to them too? Do we search those people out? If we only look for, we're showing favoritism, and it's wrong. We're all the same. It says, it says, listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which He's promised to those who love Him? Have you, have you ever read in the Bible that God didn't call call the famous and He didn't call the noble? <laughs> in Corinthians, have you ever? I'm not going to go over and read it, but uh, I, I wrote it down in my note. He said God doesn't call doesn't call the the high and mighty, and He doesn't call the noble. Uh, yeah. yeah. Hey, ain't nobody going to glory but God. We're all the same. Our faith should understand that by Christ's blood, we have all been made new creatures. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We're all the same. Then what Pastor Randy read, 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 29, he said, no man, no man can boast about this. God gets the glory. So we should look at everybody that way. You know, in Acts, the 17th chapter, it says we all came from one blood, one nation. So we're all the same. But this is this is the attitude that we should have. Verse 8, it says, If you really fulfill the ro royal law according to the Scripture. Now what's the royal... You know, when it says... When, when James... When St. James here is talking about the, the royal law, how many of you know he's talking about the kingdom? The king, God, the king. He said his law... It says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And he says, you do well if you do that. But that's how we should operate. 
We should love our neighbor. Let me, let me, let me show you. I'm on, I'm on end with this because I told you that I would. I told you that I would end at 730. Um, let me go down here. Look at Mark. I'm going to end with this. Mark, the 12th chapter. This, this this is this is the attitude. This is the attitude we should have toward everybody. Everything that we everything that that we do should be motivated by this. If you're born again, if you're if you're one of the brethren, which which Saint Paul is talking, I mean Saint uh, James is talking here. He's talking to Christian people. If we're born again. This is everything that we do should be motivated from this aspect. If we if, if anything we do for God is not motivated from these two things, it's absolutely worthless. We're just doing it because we feel like it's something that we need to do. It's got to be motivated by these scriptures. Uh it's Mark twelve, and I'll start with uh Verse 28. It says, Then one of the scribes came, having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well. And see, they had been asking Jesus questions and they're, they're trying to trap him. You know, they're trying to get him to say something that they can go and tell somebody he said. But, you know, they never trap Jesus. I mean, he ain't going to trap him. You know, he knows what, he knows what <laughs> they were going to say before they said it. I mean, I... You know, he may have been, he was fully God, but he was fully man also. You know. I mean, when you're talking to a man, uh, uh, somebody that's fully God, I mean, he, he knows what's on your mind. And, you know, you can be sitting over there thinking it, you know. Kind of like Nathaniel. He said, I seen you over there under that tree, boy. I heard what you said. He said, and, and Jesus answered, he said, he had answered them well, and he asked. So he asked him another question: Which is the first? Uh, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him. And and every everything that we do for God needs to be based on this right here. The first of all the commandment is: Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. Whatever we do needs to be motivated for our love for God. Why? Because He saved us. Oh, He saved us. Everything that we have and everything that we hope to have in Christianity comes from the main thing that Jesus died for our sins and that He was buried. <laughs> and three days He was resurrected from the dead. That's the gospel. And because He did that, we should love Him. Everything that we do should be motivated because of that love of what He did. Then it said, and the second one is like, the second one is like it. It is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than that. Why? Why should we be motivated to talk to the poor man or the drug addict or the alcoholic or anybody that we think that's not like us? We should be motivated because we love God with all our heart, mind, strength, and soul. And since we love Him, 
And because He did so much for us, we should love our neighbor as ourselves because of what God did for us. Does that make sense? That makes sense to anybody. If you're doing anything from God in any other motive beside that, you need to back up and check your check what's going on. And I and I got news for you. There's nothing that you nothing going on in your life that you can't overcome by the finished work of the cross. What Jesus did on the cross, where Jesus hung on the cross, that Jesus died for our sin, for our shame, for our suffering, for our healing. Everything that we receive and we're going to receive was because of the finished work of the cross. And we always have to go back there. And our love has to be motivated for what Jesus did for us. That's the power. You know, when I was growing up in the Pentecostal church, you would see somebody get saved and then they, they go off and do something that wasn't right. And, and the old folks would say, well, they just need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And I, I'm sitting around a kid. What's that, what's that mean? Used to when I did, I had a lot more hair. I got to thinking about it. I, yeah, you need the Holy Ghost, but when you get saved, you get the Holy Ghost. But what they was talking about, they was talking about getting filled with the Holy Ghost, and they was talking about being baptized in the Holy Ghost and all that. And then that's a bunch, of, you know, you can say whatever, you call it filled, baptized, whatever. And that's good. But you know what that, that, Filled with the Holy Ghost and baptized with the Holy Ghost does. It does give you power. Power to witness. That's what it gives you. It doesn't give you power to live right. You know what gives you power to live right? The finished work of the cross. Romans 1.16, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power unto salvation to those that what? Believe. The G first and the great. I don't know what's going on in your life, but I know the cure, the finished work of the cross. You go back to the finished work of the cross and you'll start living right. You'll start acting right. And you'll start paying more attention to the poor man. <laughs> oh! I'm talking to myself. Does that make sense? I told you I was going to... I, I'm going to do one more thing. One more thing. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, Lord, help me. Let me go back over here. I'm going to show you one thing. My wife said, if you quit chasing rabbits, you could get through. I'm here now. I love you, baby. The 13th verse says, For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Do you know how you receive mercy? You give it. You don't look at somebody and you totally cut them off and you give them no mercy. It says here, if that's how we are, then we won't get any mercy. And, and I'm gonna, I'm, I, I, I promise you, I promise you, I'm going to end with this right here. Luke 6.38. It says give, and I'm talking about mercy. This is give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put in your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. I told you I was going to end with that. Thank y'all for coming. I love all of you. Have a great night.